Hello, women made in the image of God. Today we're back with another Bible in a Year video, and today we get to read Ecclesiastes. We're going to read the introduction notes, and then we're going to read 1 through 4, because last time we decided to just finish out Proverbs so we could more focus. More focus better. That's a good sentence. But anyways, <laughs> and then we get to read 2 Corinthians 9. So let's pray and enjoy God's Word together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of your word. Lord, um, your grace is amazing. Your love is amazing. Lord, um, just thank you so much for allowing us to get into your word together today, to read it, to cherish it, to delight in you as we read your word. Lord, would you grow our delight in you? Would you grow our love for you as we read? Would you sanctify us by your word, please, Father? Uh, for your word is truth. Um, thank you so much that you sent your son so that sinners could be reconciled back to you, Lord, so that we could even speak to you, God, come before you. You are so holy, 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 and you made a way. You, you, you are so good. <laughs> You're so good. And now you've also given us your spirit to teach us and lead us, guide us. You're just so thankful, Lord. So, Father, thank you that we can call you Father. Uh, that if For all those who have repented and trusted in Jesus for salvation, that you've made us your children, Lord. You, you adopted us through the blood of your Son, Lord. Um, and we're your daughters now, and we just thank you for that, Lord. If there's any women made in your image that don't know you that are listening to this video, Father, I pray that you would make the gospel make sense to them, that they might repent of their sins and trust in you um, and realize that Jesus is the only way for them to be saved, that it's not through their own faithfulness. No, we have already failed to be faithful to you, Father. That's why we need Christ. Christ, the God-man, the perfect, the only perfect one who lived a perfect life that we never could have lived, and we did not live, but Jesus did. So Jesus died on the cross for our sins, for the sins of all those who would, admit, who would ultimately trust in him for their salvation completely. So Father, if there's anyone that's listening to this that is has been taught that, God, would you save them, Lord, would you teach them that it's only by faith alone in the risen Christ, in Christ alone, in his grace alone, that we can be saved, and that when we have salvation in Jesus, then faithfulness comes through the power of the Holy Spirit, because faithfulness is a fruit of the Spirit. But we can only be saved by faith through Christ. And that faith is later shown by our works. But we are not saved by works. So Father, I pray that you would just help us. There's so many false religions that teach that works, 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 works. But no. True Christianity, biblical Christianity, Lord, you told us. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. All who believe. But a true belief is proven by a life separate unto Christ. A life loving Jesus and now doing what he says. But you don't do what he says to be saved. Anyways, Lord. <laughs> Thank you so much for dying for our sins. Oh my goodness, it's literally like mind-blowing that you would even do that, God. Thank you so much. Let us never lose our eyes to see how amazing that is, Lord, that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. Your amazing love, your beautiful love, your care, Lord, is, is, is amazing. <sighs> um. So yeah, I just, it's just help us, God. <laughs> um, thank you, God, for today. And I just pray that as we read that um, 
they just delight in you and grow in love for you, Lord. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, uh, open up your Bible to Ecclesiastes 1, and we're going to read um, the study notes for that from the ESV Crossway introduction, just short little blurb, and then from the Reformation Study Bible notes, we're going to read um, the theology of Ecclesiastes, uh, Ecclesi Ecclesiastes in the largest story of the Bible, and Christ in Ecclesiastes, which, this is, these are my favorite sections from the Reformation Study Bible, like, honestly, this is, like, what, like, I, I just love about the, like, so good, so good, I, I love this, I love how they have this in, in the books, I like introductions, so I'm really excited to continue to see this, because, as we know, Christ Christ said that all all of scripture is about him. All of it is breathed out by God. Um, so anyways, let's read the notes. September 16th. We start ECL today. Ecclesiastes ESV Crossway Intro. Introduction. Ecclesiastes contains reflections of an old man, the preacher, as he considered the question of meaning in life. He looked back and saw the futility, vanity, of chasing after even the good things this life can offer, including wisdom, work, pleasure, and wealth. Even if such things are satisfying for a time, death is certain to end this satisfaction. In fact, God's judgment on Adam for his sin General 3 17, 19 echoes throughout the book especially 12 7. Yet the person who lives in the fear of the Lord can enjoy God's good gifts. Young people especially should remember their Creator while they still have their whole lives before them. 12 1. Traditionally interpreters of Ecclesiastes have identified the preacher, who is also called the son of David, king in Jerusalem 1 1, as Solomon 10th century BC. Reformation Study Bible Notes R.C. Sproul Ecclesiastes R.C. Sproul Notes Theology of Ecclesiastes while the book of Ecclesiastes is obviously not a systematic theology, it does communicate a profound theology that is key for understanding life and our relationship to God. One dimension of this theology calls for special comment, divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Like other books in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes does not simply address the interface between divine sovereignty and human responsibility as a theological-philosophical question that must be pondered. Rather, Ecclesiastes sets forth the teaching that with regard to our experience of life, God is absolutely sovereign and human beings are absolutely responsible. A key text that focuses on divine sovereignty is 518.63. In the first part of this text, 518.20, the preacher sees what is good and fitting v18 in the gift that God gives to some. The gift of wealth and possessions coupled with the ability to enjoy them, verse 19. The ability to enjoy life is after all a gift from a sovereign God, 224.25. In the second part of this text, 1.3, the preacher sees what is an evil v1, namely God gives someone wealth and possessions but not the ability to enjoy them. This is vanity v2. Having possessions and enjoying them are two different things and whether or not one has the ability to find satisfaction in one's possessions is determined by God. But the preacher is not a fatalist. He also teaches that God gives joy and satisfaction to the one who pleases God 226 and to those who do good 312 13. So the experience of joy and satisfaction in life is a gift from a sovereign God for those who take care of their human responsibilities. While there is a mystery here, it is a mystery that points us to Christ who through his obedience, sufferings and death has merited for us the joy heb. 12 2 and the satisfaction is, 53 and in part in this life even as we anticipate the fullness of these in the life to come. Indeed, even our present sufferings are slight momentary afflictions when compared to the glory that is stored up for us in Christ 2 Cor. 4 17. Ecclesiastes in the larger story of the Bible. The Bible storyline starts with a creation that is very good. In the beginning, under the sun was the sphere of perfect joy and perfect satisfaction for humanity. Nothing was frustrating and nothing was perplexing. All of that changed when Adam and Eve sinned against God. Under the sun became the sphere of the frustrating and perplexing, though joy and satisfaction are still to be found. The book of Ecclesiastes is a commentary on life under the sun, after the fall, and before the final redemption. Ecclesiastes teaches us to face the frustrating, perplexing aspects of life, to find joy and satisfaction with thankfulness when possible, and to fear God regardless. But how can this be done? On what resources can we draw to face, to find, and to fear? The ultimate answer is not provided in the book of Ecclesiastes but in the pages of the New Testament as they reveal to us God's final redemption in Christ. Christ in Ecclesiastes. The New Testament does not directly quote the book of Ecclesiastes, but it does allude to the book in two key texts. The first is Rome, where the Apostle Paul is describing life as it has been adversely affected by the fall. In verse 20 Paul says that the creation was subjected to futility. And the Greek word that Paul uses for futility, matiotis, is the same Greek word that the first translators of the Hebrew Bible used to translate the key term in the book of Ecclesiastes, hebel vanity. Paul is in effect describing life under the sun. As Paul describes life under the sun, he does so without despair by pointing us to the glory that is to be revealed in us, v18 and the hope v20 of being set, free v21 from the vanity of life. He says of this redemption that we wait for it with patience, v25. In this text, Paul does not tell us precisely what it is that we are waiting for, but he does in the second text, which alludes to the book of Ecclesiastes. 
This second text is 2 Corinthians 5 for 1 11. In verses 1 9, Paul describes life in a way that is quite similar to the description in the book of Ecclesiastes. We groan and are burdened VV 2 3, Echel 1 13 in the NIV we must live by faith and not by sight for 7 Echel. 8 11, 12, and our goal is to please God verse 9 XEL 2 26. Our lives are much like the life of the preacher, but there is a difference we have the Spirit as a guarantee 5 C Rom 8 23 of our deliverance through resurrection from the dead, VV 2 5 a teaching not found in Paul concludes this text in a way strikingly reminiscent of the conclusion to the book of Ecclesiastes by reminding us that we will all be judged for what we have done whether good or evil, v. 10, Echel. 12, 14. In light of our fear of the Lord, v. 11, Echel 12, 13, we seek to persuade others of the hope that we have in Christ. Because of Christ's resurrection from the dead, which guarantees our resurrection from the dead, we know that even those experiences which are frustrating and perplexing are ultimately not in vain one core. 15, 58. Ecclesiastes 1 4, Chapter 1, 1. Ecclesiastes. Yeah, before we read, I think it's just important to say, like, if we did not have Jesus, like, <laughs> Ecclesiastes 1 is like, is like, oh, I mean, not just one. Um, Ecclesiastes in general is kind of hard because to read because it's like, you know, everything's like vanity, and it's like, it's super true, because it's God's word, <laughs> but like, without Jesus, you know, it, it's bleak, man, it's bleak out here, <laughs> but we have the hope of Jesus now, um, and the people in the times they had, you know, they had Genesis 3.15, which points to that there will be a Messiah, um, but they didn't have the full understanding of, um, the beauty and the riches of knowing Christ, um, but all those who in the Old Testament that were saved, they were saved by trusting the Messiah who was to, to who was to come, that God was going to provide a deliverer. Uh, however, we have such a, we, we're so blessed um, in the church age, as, as some call it, you know, like, we, <laughs> yeah, we, we have, we're, we're very, very, uh, we're very blessed to be able to know this hope that we have the more details, you know, of the hope that we have in Jesus. Um, so that being said, uh, just, you know, as we're reading, just remember the hope that you have in Jesus. Um, and just le reading Ecclesiastes in light of that. So, um, yeah, anyways, let's read. It's, it's a good book. Um, another wisdom literature. So Ecclesiastes chapter one, let's read. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes, and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new. It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. 
I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Ecclesiastes 2 I said in my heart, Come now, I will test you with pleasure, enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, It is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks, and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold, and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the children of men. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity, and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So I turned to consider wisdom, and madness, and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, What happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies, just like the fool. So I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me. For all is vanity and a striving after wind. I hated all my toil, in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool? Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because Sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity. and a striving after wind. Ecclesiastes 3 For everything there is a season, 
and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceived that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before Him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart, with regard to the children of man, that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of men, and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward, and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Ecclesiastes 4 Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought, the dead who are already dead, more fortunate than the living, who are still alive. But better than both is he who is for them. On the side of their oppressors there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought, the dead who are already dead, more fortunate than the living, who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been, and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. Again I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches so that he never asks, For whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, 
and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he had been born poor. I saw all the living who move about under the sun, along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led, yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity, and a striving after wind. Yeah, that was, um, wow. <laughs> um, I think, like, if we didn't have the hope of eternal life with Jesus, like, this would just be, like, yeah, life sucks. <laughs> um, but yeah, because sin entered the world, I think, you know, the vanity, you know, it entered, like, the fact that everything is just meaningless without Jesus, and and if you just, and, and you notice, like, he was saying, like, what stuck out to me was, like, he's, like, gathering all these things for himself. It's, like, myself, for myself, for myself, my blah, 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 whatever, you know, um, I build houses, blah, 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 vineyards for myself, not blah, 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 sorry. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself, he, uh, he writes, um, I made my cell, the gardens and parks, um, and... Uh, then I made, you know, I made myself pools from which forest, water the forest. I also gathered for myself. Um, then, you know, it's just like all those things are going to pass away. And it's like, it, 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 and he, you know, has slaves and concubines. It's all selfish. It's all this the, this whole paragraph it, it the vanity of self indulgence wow what a great <laughs> what a great subtitle um that that uh, the ESV people put onto this because it's so true it's it's vain um that's not what we were made for we we're made for God we weren't wa made to live for self um and and actually scripture says later on. Um, in Acts twenty thirty five, um, in all things I have shown you that by working hard this way we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is incredibly true. This is so true. It's repeated because it's important. Um, it's crucial. And this is the, this is the way to actually delight and and Jesus and and living on this world, because what you do for yourself is meaningless. What you do for Christ and for His people, and it, it just with Him, you know, that's not meaningless. That's eternal. That's of eternal value. Um, and to see those that are impacted by sin and and affected by the the just the brokenness of sin to help. <clears throat> to help them is actually what brings us true delight and true joy um, in this life. Um, there will always be people that we can that we can look to help and in in the church they us as well. So, uh, which is also why it's important. Like if you're just working and you're working for nothing, you have no one to give to, no one to care for you. Like that's like that's like that's like um that's vanity we're not to do life alone uh, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil for if they fall one will lift up his fellow this is why it's important to go to church because we need to lift each other up that we might not fall as well um like in another sense you know spiritually speaking but also like it physically speaking like if you fall down and you don't have anyone to pick you up that's not great this you know, you need help, you know, um, you need other people who love you, uh, and you love them, um, 
not just you're using them like an object, like the writer. <laughs> it's like, I gathered these for myself, and I didn't hold back, blah, 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 blah. you know, it's like, okay. Um, not to mock the writer, i just saying, like, um, I'm pretty sure it's Solomon. And, uh, 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 let me, like, be careful. Yeah, traditionally interpreters of Ecclesiastes have identified the preacher who is also called the son of David, king of Jerusalem, as Solomon. And we see that Solomon literally had, like, hundreds of concubines. And so the, the way, reason why I speak like that is because I, you know, there's some part of me that doesn't like <laughs> Solomon. <laughs> but, like, at the same time, <clears throat> I love scripture. Um, I just don't like that he, like had so many women like that's like bruh like anyways thank god for sh for the new testament that talks about like biblical elders and like basically what a christian should be like in the sense of like the mature cr maturity of the christian it's so, like um, um an elder specifically a man is supposed to be um a one man of one wife so one wife <laughs> so um yeah anyways that being said um praise god for his word um t it was really good uh let's let's stop listening to me ramble and babble on <laughs> um and let's listen to brother rc sproul's notes ecclesiastes 1 to 4 chapter 1 1 1 this verse is the title to the book few books in the bible have such titles see prov 1 1 1 1 preacher hb kohelet introduction title the text emphasizes the preacher's function as gatherer of the covenant community x35 or as composer of proverbs echo 12 9 for the purpose of teaching the preacher addresses god's people not unbelievers son of david see introduction author 1 2 this verse states the theme of the book few books in the bible have such an explicit statement of the book's theme see prov 1 7 luke 1 1 4 john 20 30 31 1 2 vanity the hb word translated vanity which occurs 38 times in ecclesiastes means breath vapor or fleeting, and in the context of the book refers to that which is frustrating, temporary, or perplexing, introduction characteristics and themes. Vanity of vanities is a Hebrew way of expressing the superlative. The preacher is here clearly using hyperbole to encourage the reader to face the vanity of life. Elsewhere in the book he commends finding satisfaction, the opposite of frustration in life, and presumes that the reader will understand and not be perplexed by his message. All. This word is qualified by the phrase under the sun v3 and means everything people experience with their senses v8. 1. These verses focus the reader's attention on the frustrations of life and provide the first explanation of the meaning of vanity. Despite our engaging in all of life's activity, we seem to get nowhere in the end. Although there may be some satisfaction in accomplishments, death can seem to make them meaningless because death comes to all, and our enjoyment of them seems to end at death. Only when one is rightly oriented to the Creator do we understand the true significance of our earthly lives. 12 13 14 1 3 Gain The idea that life's labor is unprofitable, presented here as a rhetorical question, is stated directly in 2 11. Under the sun, this phrase which occurs 26 times in Ecclesiastes is synonymous with under heaven and on earth and refers to life as adversely affected by the fall, introduction, characteristics and themes. Paul's equivalent is the present evil age gal. 1-4. From the perspective of under the sun, life is often frustrating and perplexing. By contrast, from the perspective of the resurrection, life's labor is not in vain. John 6 27 29 1 core. 15 58. 1 4 goes, comes, people are constantly starting over like the sun in V5, while by contrast the earth to which every person returns abides. 1 5 hastens. The HB word shoop translated here as hastens means to pant, text note. The picture is that of the sun panting as it circles the earth, only to repeat the process day after day. A picture of exhausting, frustrating activity. 1 6 around and around. An image that communicates the same idea as the preacher's recurrent refrain striving after wind, both of which speak of the frustrations of life. 1 7 is not full. People's experiences often fail to fill or satisfy them, just as waters never fill the sea, hence life can be frustrating. 1 8 I is not satisfied. The lack of satisfaction articulates the theme of frustration, always wanting more and never having enough. 1 9 Nothing new. Cultural endeavors cannot reverse the futile and frustrating process of repeating what has already been done, because all die and their works are forgotten by humanity. Under the sun, see note on 1 3. The preacher reminds the reader that this present life is the sphere of frustration. 1 11 No remembrance. No remembrance is a curse. P.S. 83 4 Jer. The first section comes frustrating. Note the first section comes to a close. 1269 In this first half of the preacher's monologue or autobiography, he rehearses his search for escape from the vanity of life. 11218 Continuing the theme of life's frustrations and introducing the related theme of life's perplexities, these verses show how the preacher began his search for escape. 112 King, in Jerusalem, see introduction, author. If anyone could find satisfaction and meaning in life, a king could. But not even a king can escape the vanity, the fleeting and perplexing nature of life. 
113 by wisdom. Even wisdom, as wonderful and beneficial as it is, cannot totally protect people from the vanity of life. 817. Life is at times frustrating and perplexing even for the wise. Unhappy business. Human existence includes divinely imposed burdens. General 3 16 19 Ram. Jesus makes them bearable. 1128 30. God. HB Elohim. This term for God focuses on his transcendence and fits with the universal scope and application of the book's teaching 12 13 14. God's personal covenant name, HB Yahweh, conventionally rendered Lord, is not used in this book. The 40 occurrences of God in the book underscore the fact that God is very much involved in life even in its apparent vanity. 1 13, 14 under heaven, under the sun. See note on 1 3. God is active in this world as it has been adversely affected by the fall, but God is not subject to the vanity of life, as he is in heaven 5 2 not under heaven. 1 14, I have seen everything. The preacher uses hyperbole to underscore the thorough extent of his knowledge. If anyone could have figured out life by now, it would have been the preacher. Vanity. See note on 1 2. Even for the likes of the preacher, life is frustrating and perplexing at times. Striving after wind. This image is used here and elsewhere. 1 17 2 11 17 26 4 4 6 16 6 9 for the frustrating experiences of life. 1 15 crooked, lacking. The failure to straighten is frustrating, and the failure to count is perplexing. Since only David were over Jerusalem. Since only David ruled over Jerusalem before Solomon, many have questioned the Solomonic authorship of Ecclesiastes' introduction author. If Solomon is indeed the author, this phrase would refer to the pre-Israelite kings of Jerusalem e.g. Adoni Zedek, Josh. 10 1. In any case, the point being made is that even the preacher in his lofty position could not figure out life. 1 17 Striving after the wind. See note on 1 14. 1 18 Knowledge. Sorrow. Ironically wisdom can at times add to the frustration of life. The more one knows the worse off one can be, ignorance can be bliss. If even the king with all his resources could not escape the vanity of life, ordinary folk should not be surprised if they cannot escape either. Chapter 2. These verses focus on the pleasures of life, as indicated by the repetition of pleasure at the beginning v1 and the end v10. Can pleasure solve the problem of the vanity of life? No, even the pleasures of earthly accomplishments are ultimately unsatisfying for the preacher one kin. 411. 2 1 pleasure. H.B. Simka here refers to a state of happiness with a focus on senses. Enjoy yourself. Lit. See good, an expression associated with satisfaction in life, C224, where the expression is translated find enjoyment, see also 313, 6, 6. Vanity, see note on 1, 2, pleasure although good is not an absolute antidote for the vanity of life, 2, 3, cheer, wine, wine cheers God and men judge 913 and has the power to gladden the heart of man, P.S., 104, 15. My heart still guiding me with wisdom, to determine what was good for people to do, the preacher investigated life without forgetting the protective guidance of God's wisdom. This thought is repeated near the end of this section, my wisdom remained with me, via 9249, I made great works, I became great. In this subsection of 2111, the preacher tells the reader that he engaged in many building projects to escape the vanity of life. Building projects were a sign of blessing over a king's reign 2 CHR 14 7, 2 4 houses vineyards. Houses and vineyards were blessings of the covenant dot, 611, is, 521, Jer, 215. 2-5 Gardens, Fruit Trees. The language is reminiscent of the Garden of Eden General 2-9 and emphasizes the magnificence of the preacher's building projects. 2-6 to Water, Growing. The Hebrew word for to water is found in General 2-6-10 and the word for growing is found in General 2-9 evoking Edenic imagery. 2-7 Slaves, Herds, Flocks, Covenant Blessings, CF. General 12-16-2014-24-35. Any who had been before me in Jerusalem. CV-9. Since only David was king in Jerusalem before Solomon, such a saying from Solomon seems odd. Regardless the point is that the preacher was in a better position than anyone to escape the vanity of life through pleasure. 2, 9 My wisdom. C2, 3, 2, 10 Pleasure. Pleasure. C2, 1, 2, 11 Vanity. C note on 1, 2. Pleasure cannot protect from the vanity of life. Striving after wind. C note on 1, 14. Under the sun. C note on 1, 3. The preacher experienced pleasure in life but failed to achieve the satisfaction of producing anything of ultimate value. 2, 12, 17. These verses teach that wisdom offers a temporary benefit over folly, but death seems to negate that benefit in the end. 2, 12. So I turn to consider wisdom. The preacher now moves to the role of wisdom in his search to escape the vanity of life. 2.13 More gain in wisdom. Wisdom is better than folly, as it is better to walk in light than in darkness. 2.14 The same event. Death C. 2.16. 2.15 Wise. Wisdom's advantages appear to be compromised because they cannot keep the wise from the abyss of death. Vanity. See note on 1. 2. Life can be frustrating and perplexing even for the wise, and the fact that both the wise and the foolish die adds to the frustration and perplexity. 216 Number Remembrance. The preacher again mentions the curse of no remembrance. C111 and PS, 83 4 Jer. 1119, 217 Hated. Concluding that the curse of death erases the profit of wise labor, the preacher comes to hate life in this present evil age. Under the sun, vanity. See notes on 123. The preacher views death as the ultimate source of frustration and perplexity. Striving after wind. See note on 114. 218 Discussly connected to the preceding discussion of death is the prospect of working hard in life only to have a fool inherit one's wealth at death vv. 18th, 19. This thought leads the preacher to the brink of despair v20, and ironically to the commendation of joy and satisfaction in this life vv. 
24 or 26. 218 I hated. The verb links this section to the preceding one, which ends with so I hated. 317, 219 who knows. One's wealth may go to wise person or to a fool, a prospect that frustrates and perplexes the preacher. 220 despair. The preacher feels like giving up at this point. For other occurrences of this word see 1 Sam. 27, 1, Job 6 26, is, 57, 10, Jer, 225, 18, 12, 221, evil. Not a moral evil but a travesty. 223, all his days, hyperbole as in PS 90, where Moses says that the best of our years are but trouble and sorrow v 10 but then praise. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, verse 14, and make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, verse 15. If God answers prayer by granting joy and satisfaction, then all our days are not trouble and sorrow. Eat and drink, enjoyment. Eat and drink is a metaphor used elsewhere in Ecclesiastes for experiencing satisfaction in life. 8 15, 9 7. As Moses prayed for joy and satisfaction in the midst of dark times, P.S. 0 14 15, so the preacher commends joy and satisfaction despite the vanity of life. Since there is at least some joy and satisfaction in life, all is vanity must be hyperbole. 1 2 Note Introduction Characteristics and Themes. 2 25 Apart from Him. God is the ultimate source of whatever joy and satisfaction are experienced in life. 7 14. 2 26 To the one who pl- However great the temporary prosperity of the wicked, those who please God are at last the beneficiaries of God's blessings. Even in this life which is characterized by frustration and perplexity, joy can be experienced. Vanity. See note on 1. Joy and satisfaction are not an absolute antidote to the vanity of life. Striving after wind. See note on 114. Chapter 3. With grin frustration, the good times in life 714, and there are many to be enjoyed, but each good time has its corresponding bad time which brings frustration and perplexity. 3. One time. The truly wise know that all their times are in God's hand PS 115, and that there is an appropriate time for every human activity. Matter. While the HB term often refers to that which is pleasing 5412110 here, as elsewhere in the book 3175886, the word is used in a neutral sense, captured well with the word matter. 3. Two born, die. This first pair is all-encompassing from beginning to end. 3. Eight peace. The last pair ends with HB. Shalom. Signifying wholeness in all areas of life. Developed in threes is continue the theme of time 3111 developed in 318 and focus on the perplexities and frustrations of life while bringing in the themes of joy and satisfaction. 39 gain. This rhetorical question was asked earlier 13. Nothing is the implied answer, a frustrating state of affairs. 311 beautiful. The sense is appropriate. C31. This same word is translated fitting in 518. Eternity. The Hebrew term is translated forever in V14 and explained in V11 as from the beginning to the end. The heart knows that history is not meaningless but is perplexed in its efforts to discern the pattern of events. 312 Joyful. The preacher again commends finding joy in life. 224 26. manner. The preacher's major application is his repeated advice. 224 26 312 22 518 28 15, and command 9 7. 10 To find joy and satisfaction in what God has ordained for one's life. Introduction Characteristics and Themes 1 Core. 720. 1 Tim. 6 8. 314 Fear. Knowing, honoring, trusting, and obeying God. Introduction to the Wisdom Literature. X 34 8 is. 6 5 Luke 5 8, Reverend 117, 315 Driven Away. The sense of the verb here probably refers to the past, but the meaning of this last line in the verse is not clear. These verses continue the theme of time 3 1 11, 17, developed in 3 1 15, and add the themes of injustice and divine judgment, with the latter playing a key role in the conclusion of the book 12 13 14. 3 16 Under the Sun, see note on 1 3. The preacher begins this section by reminding us of the context of the discussion, the world has been adversely affected by the fall. Justice. The injustices of life make no sense to the preacher, and he seems powerless to rectify them. 317 The righteous and the wicked. As punishment for sin, people like animals ver v 1820 must die general 319. Nevertheless, the distinction between the righteous and the wicked is not removed by death but will be revealed at God's judgment. Time. God ordains whatever occurs on earth ev 18. He has also appointed a day for judging the deeds of all the day of the Lord. Joel 314. 319 Vanity. See note on 1 2, 320 to 1 place, that is the grave cf 66. Who knows whether the spirit of man, elsewhere the preacher observes that though the physical body returns to dust, the spirit returns to God, 12 7 when, nothing better, the preacher again commends finding joy and satisfaction in life where and when one can, 2 24 3 12, introduction, chapter 4, 4 1 3, these verses follow up the theme of injustice with the related theme of oppression, 4 1 3 under the sun, see note on 1 3, another result of the fall is oppression, 4 1 power, the preacher complains that the oppressors have all the power, 4 2 3 more fortunate, better than both, Viewing the plight of the oppressed, the preacher concludes that the dead and unborn are better off. 4 4 6 These verses teach that contentment is better than the turmoil of envy. 4 4 Vanity. See note on 1 2. Striving after wind. See note on 1 14. 4 6 Quietness. Notwithstanding his previous dark thoughts, the preacher does conclude that sufficiency with contentment is better than need resulting from laziness verse 5 or excess, accompanied by restless toil vv. 6 8. Striving after the wind. See note on 1 14 4 7 8. These verses focus on the futility of labor without community. 4. 7. Vanity. See note on 1, 2. Under the sun. See note on 1, 3. 
These verses continue the theme of community, but from the positive perspective of the benefits that community affords. 4. 9. 2 are better than 1. Companionship rather than solitary labor is most beneficial. 4. 10. 1 will lift. Companionship benefits those who find themselves in need. 4. 11. Lie together. Probably refers to companions on a journey rather than to husband and wife. 4. 12. Prevail. Companionship benefits those who find themselves opposed. Threefold chord. The logic of this concluding proverb is that if two are good, as in the examples in VV, 9, 12, then three are even better. Community has benefits. 4, 13. These verses teach that wisdom is better than wealth or folly, but even wisdom's benefits have their limits. 4, 13. Better. Links this section to the previous one, V9. Wisdom is better than wealth and folly. 4, 15, 16. Under the sun, all the people. See note on 1, 3. Under the sun is the sphere of all humans. 4.16 will not rejoice. Discontented people do not appreciate good leaders, a thought that brings the preacher back to his theme of the apparent futility of life. Similarly, the preacher will later bemoan the fact that a wise deliverer is not long remembered. 9.15. Striving after the wind. See note on, 2 Corinthians 9. Chapter 9. 9.2 9, Achaia, southern Greece where Corinth was located. 9.4 We would be humiliated, since the Macedonians, despite their poverty, had begged for the privilege of contributing to the offering. Paul wants to avoid embarrassment both for the Corinthians and for himself, in the event that the confidence he had expressed in the latter's generosity were to prove to be misplaced. 9. 5. The gift. Paul wants to preserve the motive of willing, generous giving. The actual amount he takes to Jerusalem is of secondary importance. Second Corinthians 9. Second Corinthians 9. Now, it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints, for I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready, as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated, to say nothing of you, for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised, so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission, flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ, and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. 2 Corinthians 9, 9 2 Achaia, southern Greece where Corinth was located. 9 4 We would be humiliated, since the Macedonians, despite their poverty, had begged for the privilege of contributing to the offering. Paul wants to avoid embarrassment both for the Corinthians and for himself, in the event that the confidence he had expressed in the latter's generosity were to prove to be misplaced. 9. 5. The gift. Paul wants to preserve the motive of willing, generous giving. The actual amount he takes to Jerusalem is of secondary importance. 9. 6. Sows. Reap. An agricultural metaphor. The farmer who plants much seed reaps a large crop, but a small planting yields a small harvest. This promise is also true in the spiritual realm. Those who give generously will reap abundantly for the kingdom. What is given is never lost, it is sown. While God may at times provide a generous harvest in the physical and material realm to those who give, this is not the primary NT promise or pattern. 8. 9. 11. 27. Luke 6. 25. James. God loves a cheerful giver, giving can and should be joyful, as the Macedonians' eagerness had shown, 815. Paul's assurance is that God will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and that you will be enriched in every way not necessarily promises that God will reward generous contributions with financial prosperity for one's personal enjoyment. Rather, eager giving deepens one's experience of God's grace verse of 14, which sets the heart free from a grasping fixation on money and material possessions. Such riches enable believers to sow even more in generosity toward others, yielding a harvest of your righteousness. 9.14. Through such giving, needs are met and God is thanked. 
The recipient's prayers for the givers are no small reward. Our giving is only a small imitation of God's own excellent generosity to us, especially in the inexpressible gift of His Son John 3.16. Our giving is only a small imitation of God's own excellent generosity to us, especially in the inexpressible gift of His Son John 3.16. Well, amen to that, and let's close our time in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to read together today. I pray that you would help us to continue to meditate on what we've read. Um, Jesus, thank you so much for dying on the cross for our sins, um, that you gave your life for us. Um, so yeah, just pray that Continue to please God help us to continue to think on these things. Uh, we need you, Lord, more than we know. Um, help us to not be selfish, but to live for the one who died and rose again for our sake. Um, and yeah, help us to remember that everything has a time, um, and to just enjoy you every step of the way and seek your will, um, not our own. Uh, because to, to live for self-gain and self-satisfaction alone is just meaningless, but to live to be satisfied in God and to make others uh, glad in God um, is the best thing to live for, Lord, um, because you are the one that satisfies and uh, helping others, uh, you know, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so what is the best thing that we could give to somebody is the gospel. It's the gospel. Um, and then also adorning that proclamation of the gospel with every kind of good work of um yeah because you first saved us so lord would you just move us in love to those around us and would you help us to not look at ourselves and what we want but to look at others and how we can love them um all in light of your great love not uh not selfishly, but uh, selflessly, because you lived and died and rose again for us. Uh, would we just be consumed by that love and uh, just desire to um, tell others about you, Lord, and to give what we have, whether it be time, money, uh, the, the talents that we've been given that we can you know, like use those to serve others. That's what gives meaning to our life. And, and what we do for you, Lord, it, it's eternal. It's of eternal value. So, Lord, we long to be with you one day. And we know that for all those who trust in Jesus, that we will get to be with you one day, like literally face to face. And right now we get to be with you as well. Um, just, to, you know, it's more walking by faith and not by sight, Lord. But one day our, our faith will give way to sight, and Lord, we look forward to and long for that day. And until that day, Lord, we thank you for this confidence and hope that you've given us, Lord. This eternal hope of being your children now, and just so many things, Lord. Oh, you're so good. Um, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Um, pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, so yeah, that's all the text for today. Grace and peace. Scripture is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.